Okay, so the title of my talk is Synthetic Structural Biology. And uh, our aim is to um, exploit the viral assembly principles that you may have attend, uh, heard about in a talk by Roya uh, a few weeks ago on virus uh, assembly. And we want to use these viral assembly principles as an antiviral strategy. And structural biology, uh, the motto of structural biology is structure implies function. And the kind of meaning of that is if we understand the structure, uh, then you know, we know how the molecule works. And you know, kind of the, the paradigmatic example is the structure of double helix DNA. Once we discovered its structure, then you immediately could understand its function as a genetic material you know, that could uh, self-replicate. And synthetic structural biology, but what I mean by that is that we seek to elucidate the engineering principles to build structures for new functions. And then at the bottom of the screen here, I have DNA. Uh, for those who read Japanese, you know, this is Ori and this is Gami. And then, uh, so Ori is, uh, you know, uh, folding and uh, Gami is paper folding. We're doing DNA folding. And then this is uh, Ju Jitsu. So Ju Jitsu is Ju means yielding and Jitsu is a kind of a technique. So jujitsu is this technique where you use the opponent's force against them. So we're going to use the viral assembly principles, you know, against the viruses. So that's jujitsu part. Uh, so the team who did this work is a collaboration with the group of Dietz at uh, TUM in Munich and uh, a, a large team at the Brandeis Mersec. Uh, that's working on origami as a mechanism, as a as a as a method of studying self-assembly. You know, and this is kind of the full uh, uh, NSF Mersec team uh, pre-pandemic, a few weeks before the pandemic. Uh, so we don't have our masks on at our winter school, which has been uh, postponed this year. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back in person uh, next year. Okay, so this work, uh, uh, the history of this kind of approach comes from Buckminster Fuller. So Buckminster Fuller was a uh, architect, a inventor who built uh, these geodesic domes, you know, and this is this huge, beautiful dome uh, that he built for the Montreal World's Fair uh, surrounding a complex. And uh, yeah, so one of the, if you look on Wiki, one of the fun facts about him is he was kicked out of Harvard twice as an undergrad. The first time for having a really big party with vaudeville uh, actors and characters and that got wild and he got kicked out. And then he came back uh, and then got kicked out a second time for uh, inattention to classes. And, uh, so anyway, um, he, uh, he, built this dome uh, in, in Kabul as part of the Cold War in the, in the late 50s. And the US government just decided at the last second that they needed to build this dome. So they gave him 30 days to make the whole design, construct the parts, ship it to uh, Afghanistan, and then have it be assembled by uh, unskilled labor. And you know, it got assembled in 24 hours. And so um, this motivated Don Casper, uh, who uh, was studying viruses at the time uh, and trying to figure out the structure of viruses uh, and that the, that the viruses could share some of the attributes of these domes. And so here is a picture of Don in Buckminster Fuller's home, uh, you know, talking about the the design and the assembly of uh, you know viruses and these uh, structures uh, and I see Don is in the audience uh, today so you can ask Don questions about his theory of virus assembly which I'll go over in a in a few minutes but uh, I'm sure I'll get the details wrong you can ask Don later uh, 
for, for the question, uh, if you have any questions about it. So the assembly principles was you had these hubs and they either had five uh, holes in them or six. And then there were two different length struts and they were marked with like red, you know, red stripe here. And then there's a red hole. And basically you just stick the red, the red pole into the red hole, the blue pole into the blue uh, uh, hole, and then boom, you get this structure. And you know, so here's a virus herpes, 100 nanometers across. Here's the Kabul dome, 10 meters across. And Don thinks, okay, uh, there, there's going to be an analogy between these, these, this architecture uh, of the virus and the architecture of the domes. Okay, what, what's going to be our, our holes and struts? What's going to be our plates and, and, and poles? We're going to use DNA origami. And so, you know, our red and blue parts that make together are going to be the, uh, you know, complementary strands. And so in DNA origami, you take a one long strand called a scaffold. Ours is 8,000 bases long. And then, you, and that's just given to you. You take it from some bacteria. And then you design 200 short oligos, each of about 50 length. And what, what happens is the oligos pinch together or staple, these are called staples, uh, different uh, uh, portions of your big scaffold. And they cause it to then fold into a certain shape. And so, of course, if you want to cover nature, you fold it into a smiley face because everybody loves smiley faces. And so that's how you get the cover uh, uh, of nature. So that was back in 2006, the first origami uh, paper, uh, which is a beautiful, <laughs> extraordinary paper. Um, and so the key kind of architectural motif is this holiday junction. So if you have two independent strand, uh, double-stranded DNA, like, like this one black red, this one blue green. And you design it in such a way that this red one would rather displace this upper portion of the green like this, and the green would rather displace the lower portion of the red like this. Then now these two uh, independent double helices are joined together. And that's the staple. That's the thing that gives it the structural integrity is this holiday junction. So it's all about engineering the holiday junction. That's what origami is about. Okay, so engineering the holiday junction. So we had, uh, you know, our big scaffold, you know, and so if you just zoom in, this, this blue strand is this blue strand, you know, this runs out the board and comes back. There's one long blue strand, 8,000 basis long, and then you design these hundreds of little uh, colored strands you know, and you just, you design them on a computer program, you put them on an Excel spreadsheet, you send it out to IDT, three days later, you get these 96 well plates with, uh, you know, 100 animals of these things, you just pipe it together, the thing assembles. Uh, so it's a very, it's a very kind of rapid process, you know, so you design your staples, it pinches it together, locally, you have all these holiday junctions, and now here, we only showed holiday junctions in 2D, but you can have a holiday junction instead of going side by side, you can have it going to the uh, helices that are in and out of the plane as represented here. And so then you can have it fold up into any structure you want in three dimensions. And so that's the, that th those are the materials we are gonna use to build, to do our synthetic structural biology. So what about the structural biology? What about the Casper Klug theory for how viruses are assembled? So the, the simplest viruses just have a single coat protein uh, to, to build the capsid. And you have 60 copies of an identical protein. So the Casper Klug theory then seeks to understand how that's, uh, you know, how, how does that work? And, uh, and, um, and so here you have a triangular net in two dimensions where these little blue uh, circles represent the individual proteins. And you have a coordinate system as it's a triangular net. 
you know, H is uh, the coordinate in one direction, and then at 60 degrees, uh, uh, at uh, 100 and uh, at 60 degrees, you have, you know, the next uh, angle uh, for your coordinate, you know, we call it H and K. And so your kind of unit cell is a single triangle. And what you do in the Casper Kluge formulism is you cut out 20 of these triangles from the uh, lattice. And then uh, in this picture, these are represent the proteins of the virus, you know, and here they are abstracted as circles. And then the algorithm is that along these edges that you've cut out, you glue the edges together. So here you see one, two, three, four, five points. You're going to glue these together. You're going to have a vertice with five uh, uh, sides to it, five faces of the triangle. And then if you follow that algorithm out, you get an acosahedron. So this is one of the platonic solids. This is the largest platonic solid, and it's the largest object that's completely symmetrical. It's made out of identical units in identical environments. Every one of the 60 proteins has its neighbors arranged in exactly identical ways. And you know, in the late 50s, when the first electron microscopes came out, uh, then uh, you could see the structure of the viruses and that there were 60 units. But then very shortly after, they began to see that there were larger viruses, but they weren't 61 units, they weren't 62 units, they were 180. And so the question is, you know, then uh, how do you make a, you know, a cosahedron with 180 units? And so the Casper Kluge theory, you know, uh, and it's also, you know, how do these proteins assemble? And so it was reasoned that there has to be local rules. So imagine there's 60 of us in the audience. So imagine each of us donates your left hand and all of us put our left hands virtually uh, together into a pile, you know? So we have 60 of us reaching into the screen with your left hand and you follow these rules. The rules are take your thumb and find somebody's other hand and with that thumb, touch their pinky, okay? So here, thumb to pinky, thumb to pinky, thumb to pinky. And if everybody does that, then we're gonna have five hands around like this. And we have another rule. Uh, that you have to do simultaneously. Take your middle finger uh, and go to your ring finger. Okay, so here's middle finger, ring finger, middle finger, ring finger, uh, middle finger, ring finger. And that gives you threefold symmetry. And you have a third rule, index finger to index finger, that gives you a twofold symmetry, a twofold axis. So if everybody, you know, we put 60 hands into the screen, and you say, these are the three rules. You know, you look at all these different hands around and, and you just, and you see a thumb, you put your pinky on it. If you see an index finger, you know, you put an index finger on it. If you see a ring finger, you put your middle finger on it. If everybody does this, we get an acosahedron. <laughs> so this is the, the Casper Kluge uh, theory, you know, cause the proteins don't have a master plan. There's no master architect. They each by themselves have to figure out, you know, what to do. And so you can think of it as 20 triangles. And that's what we're going to do with the origami. We're going to build triangles that we're going to program together. And then these triangles are going to, uh, are going to, uh, uh, are going to stick together through like a, uh, um, index finger, index finger interaction. Okay, so now what happens if you wanna make something bigger than 60? 60 is the biggest you can make out of identical ones. And so Casper realized, okay, I can cut out a larger triangle that involves three smaller triangles like this. And then, uh, you know, where I go one along the H axis, one along the K, and these are where I'm gonna make my cuts. And so then here I've cut out five, now here I've cut out 20. And then I fold up these 20, it's going to be again an acosahedra. But now you have regions with six neighbors alternated wherever there's a cut like this, an edge like this, you're going to have five neighbors. So if you look over here at the virus itself, here in the red are the regions with five-fold coordination, and in the middle are the regions with six. And so you 
So, so then this implies that you can no longer have proteins in the identical environment. So if you look at a single triangle, uh, just focus on any uh, single triangle, like, like you know, this one here with these three uh, colors. So this one here, red, that's going to be in a five-fold environment. And these two, you know, orangey colors are in six-fold uh, uh, environments, but they're not the same. So if you, if you, if you say, you, if you think of this guy, this guy on its left has a five-fold neighbor, on its right, it has a six-fold neighbor, while this guy on its left has a six-fold neighbor, and on its right, it has a five-fold neighbor, and this five-fold has two six-fold neighbors. So there's three different environments, three different symmetries. It's not you kind of broken the symmetry. And so um, in the Casper and Kluge theory, then they enumerate all these possibilities. So like here is this one where you go one along the H axis, one along the K, and then that's where you put your fivefold. And by uh, the Euler topology, you need to have 12 fivefolds to uh, close a sphere in three dimensions, you know? And so in this case, you go two on the H axis, one in the K, and then you replace the six fold, you know, you make a cut, you replace the six fold with a five fold, you know, and then this is your triangle. And, and then this formula tells you how many different symmetries, how many distinct symmetries you have to have in this object. So this is this theory of Casper and Kluge, who gets a Nobel Prize uh, and made in 1962, and uh, you know that uh, that explains the structure. And and then Casper uh, later, when Casper comes to Brandeis and forms the first structural biology department uh, in the world, he he coins the name structural biology as a field and forms the first lab that's named that at at Brandeis. And then a decade later, he hires me in 1980, one of my first jobs in, uh, uh, in science <laughs> over 40 years ago, was working for Don uh, uh, on uh, building uh, x-ray detectors, uh, digital x the first generation of digital x-ray uh, detectors. You know, and so here's, I don't know if you can see, these are people for scale bars. Here's people standing, uh, a whole line of people standing at, uh, um, you know, in front of this, uh, in Orlando, in Disney World, uh, the uh, Epcot Center uh, geodesic dome. So that's a really big, <laughs> big virus. And so pretty much every virus found uh, and structure determined follows this Casper Klug plan of these quasi equivalent uh, shapes. Okay, so we wanna do the same thing. We're gonna build uh, out of origami where you see this 3D printed object where each of these cylinders is going to be a cylinder uh, double stranded DNA and that we're gonna fold around. And then the kind of idea is then just through random uh, thermal motion that these uh, objects, these colloidal objects are going to self-assemble into you know, structures based on this, this principle of quasi-equivalence. And so there's two ways that we're gonna use the energetics of DNA to drive the assembly, uh, base stacking and hybridization. Hybridization is where we're building the single object, that triangular motif where we take our scaffold and the staples and we design these 200 staples to have the thing fold up into this triangle. And the, um, where, where in this mapping to the theory of Casper and Kluge, each side of the triangle represents a protein uh, with its, and if all three sides of this triangle are the same, then that's the symmetry of the cosahedron where they're all identical. That's the smallest possible virus in Don's nomenclature, the T equals one. So we're using the hybridization as our high energy type bonds to fold the structure. And then we're gonna use the van der Waals base stacking energies in order to cause these motifs to uh, stack together. 
All right. And so here's showing the, the energy of the, 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 the electromagnetic energy of the Van der Waals as little lightning flashes. Okay, so we're going to use then. You have about concept, five minutes left. Uh, we're going to use this concept from biochemistry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Of lock and key shape complementarity, where we're going to make a hole by making a gap in the double helix. And then we're going to have the, uh, them fit together. There's no hybridization here at all. It's just the base stacking energy that holds them together. Okay. And so here is a uh, one of our folded uh, structures. This is data. This is high resolution cryo uh, microscopy. And you can see the helices. And I just want to step back that, so these are you know, 50 nanometer objects, but this is kind of an incredible accomplishment. This is something I've been trying to do in colloidal science my entire career. That is make a colloid where you can control to sub nanometer accuracy, the location of every atom of every molecule and you can engineer to a fraction of a KT the interaction between the colloids. So this has been the holy grail of self-assembly to make colloids where you can have the shape uh, arbitrary and the uh, number of bonds and number of directions uh, uh, arbitrary. And, and it turns out with the origami, it's easy to make these things with high yield. And to me, that was just stunning that one could do it so simply with and with a super high yield. Uh, so these, this is data. And then you mix them together and you can you know, make kind of whatever shape you want. So here's octahedra, here's a costahedra, this is data. And then uh, if you wanna make the T3, then uh, you need three different symmetries. So you make the three sides of the triangle different because each side of the triangle represents a protein. So it's like two different proteins. So we make one interaction for the five-fold, the red mates to the blue, that gives you the five-fold. And then for the six-fold, you, you know, we have one side mates to itself, and that's the six-fold, and that leads to this structure. And so then here's the, um, here's the implementation in terms of origami. Uh, it's just a few changes from the first T1 structure. And then, uh, you know, you do your cryo EM, here's individuals, you do a class average of fat, you know, series 612 particles average together. And then, you know, you stop it. Here is a five fold, one, two, three, four, five. Casper Kluge says you go one axis down, you should be a six. And then you go one in the K, five again. So it's exactly uh, the designing principle of Casper and Kluge here in the T3. We did T4, we did T9, you know? Okay, so now let's get to the antiviral. In nature, this is how one of the natural mechanisms as antiviral, this is against the HIV protein. So there's a, a elongated part of the HIV and then there's these proteins, trim proteins that just, that form a scaffold this hexagonal scaffold around the uh, HIV core. And that prevents the HIV core from assembling and from infecting your cells. So there's a, there's a natural mechanism that's different than antibodies where you sterically hinder the uh, uptake of virus into your cells. So we're gonna do the same thing. So we take our capsids, instead of making them as closed objects, we make them as open objects, like a pitcher plant that, that digests flies. And then we functionalize the inner side with uh, antibodies, in this case, against human hepatitis uh, uh, B. Okay, so we have our octahedra, and there are the antibodies there. And then, you know, this is kind of like a Star Wars capsule, you know, space thing. And then it comes in and it grabs, this is data, right? This is data, prio data. Uh, the, eight, the, the hep B, and then now the hep B can no longer touch your cell, can't fuse with your cell, it can't infect you. And so then here's with open acosahedra, and you know here we've captured inside the, like the pitcher plant three, uh, three of them. And so then to test, does this work? Does this prevent uptake? We do ELISA. So ELISA is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. 
So you put antibodies to your virus down on the surface. And now you flow in your, your virus. So if your virus is present, uh, you know, so this is the test you see if you have COVID antibodies, right? You pour in and your, your virus, it sticks to it. And then to read out, you, you then, you flush, and now you pour in again a, a antibody that's been conjugated with a horseradish peroxidase. And then you flow in the substrate to the horseradish that, that then converts it to a, a dye molecule, it turns orange, and, and then you see it. And if your thing is, is your virus can't bind to the surface, then you don't get any orange. You know, it's like a pregnancy test. You get an orange strip or, or no strip, that you have it or you don't. And so, you know, to, to summarize, you know, we get like 99% blockage when we add the, uh, uh, the shells, the, the, the origami shells versus uh, we get 20% blockage. If we add antibodies at a 400 to one ratio, uh, we get 20% blockage. Because you see, if you have a virus, the virus has a hundred different binding sites. There's a hundred spike proteins like on the COVID. If just one of them is still active, it can infect your cell. So you have to block them all with antibodies. In our case, we only need one to be functionalized because if one antibody binds the capsid, the entire capsid is prevented from fusing with your cell. So this is a much more efficient way of neutralizing virus than the way your body does it with individual antibodies that have to coat every, uh, every um, spike protein. You know? And so then going forward, now we have to change the dimensions. So the Hep B is only 30 nanometers. The COVID is you know, 100 to 200 nanometers. It's highly variable. So you know, we need to make a different strategy for the anti-COVID. But, but we think this is a potential uh, effective antiviral strategy that should, in principle, have a higher efficiency than traditional antibodies. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, here's the team uh, at uh, the Brandeis Mersec working on this. Okay, great. Thanks, Seth, for that uh, great talk. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first is from uh, Raphael asking, which are the outlier viruses from Casper Kluge theory? And is it known if the number of outlier virus types increases or decreases over time during the evolution? Yeah, well, probably Don should. Uh... <laughs> If Don is here, he should answer that. Uh, one of the outliers was, was um, polyoma virus, which was all five-fold coordinated. I remember when I was a grad student, uh, Don submitted that paper to Nature and it was rejected because it violated the Casper Klug theory. And for 20 years at that time, every virus discovered for, uh, fit the Casper Klug theory. And so who was Casper to submit <laughs> what, but it turned out Casper was right. It was all fivefold anyway, but it took like a year or two of fighting with the referees. Anyway, but, uh, uh, but I don't know, Don, are you there? You want to answer that? I don't know if his mic is on. I, uh, Maybe we'll have a chance to, um, to, to get to that during the informal session. And okay. um, we do have several questions that are pouring in. So, um, right. yeah. Uh, Saad Ansari is asked Is it possible to design traps for multiple types of viruses inside the same capsid? Yeah, yes, of course. So, that's one of the real advantages. So, our capsids have hundreds of potential binding sites. So, you could put a hundred different antibodies in there. And so, you know, you can have a whole cassette or like your got a COVID and there's like 50 different mutants going around, you can put an antibody for each of those mutants on it. You know, so it's a very like flexible, multivalent uh, strategy. Okay, and we have a couple of questions related to the, uh, the, the antiviral. So I'll try to combine some of them into how do we practically use um, the origami antivirals? Are the shapes stable enough to exist in the body? So the shapes can be stabilized through, um, you can add photoactivated uh, units, uh, moieties. Uh, so by substituting some of the, the uh, nucleic acid bases with some photoactivated 
uh, molecules so that you can then covalently bond them together.